Good morning. Welcome to HRDP. I'm, I'm super proud and super happy to be your keynote today. I'm a bit nervous, so um, excuse me if I, if I uh, speak a bit fast. Um, anyway, so today, this morning, I'm here to talk to you about the past, the future, and uh, wherever the hell we are now. Um, a little bit about, about myself. The introduction was quite short. Hello, this is me. This is the, the, the pink girl over here to the left. This is me. Um, I'm a security researcher. I, I only done this for a couple of years now. When did I start in 2011? So I might not have half the experience of most of the people in the room, but I have a very long track record of changing jobs. And changing my jobs every so often, I learn lots of things that go right in our world and there are lots of things that go wrong in our world. And today I'm going to tell you about all the things that I saw that... Um, got me very excited about keeping, keeping up my job in security and, and keep on going and trying to uh, make things better. So just recently, um, about half a year ago, I, I made another job change and moved to Portland, Oregon to start my work at Intel as a security engineer. And um, you might, might know that Intel is a, is a large company and they produce a very complex technology and they have lots of problems that we can work on. So this was a very exciting change for me. Um, what also came with a change, of course, are the legal disclaimers. So since I work for Intel, I have to tell you that I do not speak for Intel. Um, anything I say uh, up on the stage is my own uh, sole opinion and does not uh, include or present opinions of my employer in Intel Corporation or, or its affiliates. Either way, back to myself. So I'm going to be speaking for 45 minutes about myself. Um, what, what do I mean if I say I have a long track record of changing jobs? So um, I, I started my, my professional experience as a, as a scripting monkey at an antivirus company. I went on to be a malware analyst at this antivirus company. I uh, studied myself and to become a reverse engineer. I really fell in love with the x86 instruction set. Um, from there, I went into something that they still call advanced threat detection. Um, from there, I went to... I uh, live out my hobby as a nation-state malware observer, as I like to call it. From there, I went into incident response. Um, so not that many nation-state malwares, but lots of ransomwares. Uh, from there, I went low-level because I was disappointed. Why was I so disappointed? Oh, I missed one, one important thing that I did in my life. I spoke at HIDB. This is my first hike in the box. I'm super happy to be here, just to have mentioned that once. <laughs> All right. Um, Lots of things that I did and lots of, lots of disappointment and lots, lots of moments being upset. But why? Why, why, did, I, why did I change jobs often or why did I uh, decide to go even lower than the instructions that the x86 instructions that are? And why, why was I upset? In my, uh, in, my, in my younger years, when I was picking my first jobs and, and picking up my first challenges, um, I, I was, I, I would call myself a believer. I started to work, like, long, long time ago before I went, uh, lower. I started to work as an, as a malware analyst in antivirus, and I really thought technology there works. Um, but let me start at the end of the story. Uh, so recently I decided to, to go low. What do I mean with go low? Um, if you, if you start work at Intel, they tell you, I'm not kidding, you have six months of time to ramp up on the topics that we're working on here. And I thought they were kidding me. Six months of time, I thought in six months of time someone can build a CPU. And I was wrong. It turns out I've been there for seven months and I'm slowly starting to figure out how things work. And we're not even there yet. So um, if you start working on the, the Intel macro architecture, I would compare that with someone gives you a little ice pick and then puts you in front of an iceberg and tells you, here, work on that. So this is where I am right now, trying to ramp up still. This, all, this whole story of my professional experience, though, started a uh, long, long time ago, let's say, in a, in a land far, far away, when, as I mentioned, I was a malware analyst and I was a believer. So in 2011, I started work at an antivirus company, and I started work on their signature database. I started work on their, their product. I started work on their backend. I wrote lots of scripts for automation, for automated analysis. I did some research on artificial intelligence and feature extraction and whatnot. And I really thought that we, we improved defense that way until I realized after spending um, about two or three years in the industry that what we do is we run after the threats, not the threats run from us. So in a sense, the, the classical way of threat detection, as I learned, was to create patterns that detect threats, which implies that we knew the patterns before we knew the threats because we wanted to find the threats that we didn't know. 
I figured out in the whole threat detection scene overall, we all are searching for something. After antivirus, I went into advanced threat protection, whatever that term implies, and I found out that even there, where everything's more advanced, people are still searching for patterns. We all search for patterns that are either known to be bad, we're searching for patterns that are known to be good, we're searching for patterns that are not known to be good, if you want to only whitelist things that are known to be good. And in the end, this covers all of the technology that is out there. Whether we search for signatures, whether we search for behavior, whether we search for anomalies, whether we apply artificial intelligence and machine learning, whatever technology we apply, we also always search for patterns. If those patterns aren't there, we have no chance of actually finding the threat. This is why threat protection is stuck in the loop for the past couple of years. We try to come up with smarter patterns. We would love to have one pattern that finds everything that's bad and nothing that's good. We would like to have the pattern that is super small, so we can store it in small databases and don't cover all the memory of our customers. We would like to have the one pattern that no one can break. So this one pattern will always find all the bad stuff and never find all the good stuff. And this pattern just doesn't exist. This is why we're stuck in this, um, in this scenario. And as you can see on the screen, I used Sid from Ice Age to represent what we cannot do, because Sid is hunting his nasal nut. Uh, and the, the thing that the, the benefit that Sid has with that hazelnut is that he can see the hazelnut. He knows how the hazelnut looks like. In threat detection, we never even knew how the hazelnuts they were hunting for look like. So from there, um, I went on to be a believer in indicators of compromise. I thought if we make our patterns just smarter, we could eventually cover all the bad things and leave out all the good things. And so uh, let's find the threats. And then I found another paradox in threat detection which is a couple of years ago, people said antivirus is dead and signature matching and pattern matching doesn't work anymore. And then they came up with threat intelligence and indicators of compromise and they stuffed those indicators of compromise with patterns. And eventually I was sitting there. So before we had signatures that were byte patterns. Now we have domain names and MD5 hashes. And how did we get smarter over the years? How did this get better? And turns out eventually we didn't. So yeah, now I'm asking you, spot the problem. We're still trying to find things that we don't know with patterns. And um, are epically stuck on that. So this is why I'm talking about the threat detection myth. After a couple of years in threat detection, I figured out that this is all not actually what I wanted to work in because it's not working the way I thought it should be working. That might be the teenage me being disappointed with the dream that I had. Um, but they're all, I would assess that as the opening note stated, businesses will business. Any customer that you has, have that, that trusts in antivirus, that trusts in threat protection, they're still mainly interested in their own business and their own uh, making money and, and putting food on their tables. And in that sense, they will happily rely on the threat detection myths that we sell them. On the other hand, you have antivirus engineers I've been there, I've been sitting there, I've been engineering threat protection mechanisms. And I've, I, when I did this, you have to consider, I was in my 20s and I had no idea how large networks look like. I engineered my threat detection uh, metrics like I have to protect one computer. And this is true for most of the engineers that work on this technology, they want to protect one computer. They want to protect five computers. They have no idea how to protect thousands of computers that are all on the same network and need the same kind of protection. And in the end, the myth that I'm actually talking about why it will always work, work but never does, is because, as I mentioned, we come up with patterns that detect things that we don't know. There's some, um, let's say a new vulnerability is discovered or a new exploit uh, appears in the threat landscape. The, the theory goes that as soon as the vulnerability is out, threat protection can come up with patterns to detect exactly that uh, threat that exploits the vulnerability. But in the end, this is a lost game. There's so many vulnerabilities, there's so many exploits that the system just can't keep up with the threat detection. So yeah, I was frustrated and I left. I went on to um, explore the world of tooling, as I would say. So my time in working in advanced threat protection, um, I saw our engineers come up with mathematical models that I never did and will never understand that magically take in data and come out with threat detection. So 
Uh, what I'm talking about is artificial intelligence and uh, the threat detection aided by machine learning, where if we just had the features that would describe the threats, we could mathematically determine whether some sample or some attack is, uh, or, or some, some certain item is malicious and could detect it that way. Turns out though, the longer I was sitting there, I was wondering like the smart mathematicians with their models, I trust them, I know that they're doing their job well, I know that ma uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence work. What I'm not sure about is that they understand the data they feed their algorithms. So looking at the advanced threat protection systems, um, they try to determine whether they have um, apples or oranges in front of them based on features like the outside temperature and the size of the tree that the product has grown on. This is what we're talking about when we speak about advanced threat protection. We have feature sets, uh, we need feature sets that eventually describe the size of the apple, the color of the apple, the smell of the apple, and not the size of the tree on, on which it has grown on. In that sense, I dug deeper into the whole problem of features. I'm, I'm not kidding, I spent long, long nights on figuring out which features tell me whether a binary or whether an actual item of, of interest is malicious. And I came up with many ideas. I had long lists of features that would tell me whether something is malicious or not. And then I tried to implement my ideas and figured out that the tools aren't actually there to get those features. So I dove into into reverse engineering tool development in order to be able to extract static features from binaries. Because this is what I thought was the solution. If we just had better features, we could improve threat detection forever. So I tried to figure out how, how could I uh, automatically extract features from binaries without having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars in licenses of tools. And I figured out there is tools out there. They work on the machines of the developers that develop them. In a sense, <laughs> I see someone laughing in the audience who knows what I'm talking about. Um, the problem of, uh, of static analysis, as I, I see it, tell me if, I'm, if you think I'm wrong, that's totally fine. The, the problem as I see it is that developing tools for static analysis or developing anything that helps reverse engineering in, in, in the lower level um, is not worth the market that wants to buy it. If you look into, into static analysis tools, there's very few products out there that can actually be bought. They're ridiculously expensive. The products that are out there that are open source and free are beautiful, but don't always produce the data that you want to have from them. And um, I figured out that there's at least one um, open source version engineering tool out in the wild that is super promising and is actually very impressive and has been developed for more than 10 years but only one single guy, more or less, who totally is in love with this project and wants to keep it going. But the guy has to eat too. The other people that work on the project are, are students and do most of the time in their spare time and they are super engaged, they produce lots of code, most of the code works, but they also have to eat. And that's a major problem that I see in static analysis why why we can't have nice features that could in the end improve our threat detection by so much further because we don't have the tools because the people who write them actually want salaries. In the end, if I look at the whole threat detection, um, threat detection landscape, at, at all the products that we have out there, if I look at all the money that went into sandboxes for dynamic analysis, if I just think that if we had taken some of those percentages, like some of the money and put it aside and gave it to the people who write static analysis tools, we could have dynamic and static detection, uh, detection next to each other, which would improve our detection quality by so much further. We just think about it. Um, at the root of it though, I blame, I blame places like Silicon Valley for exactly the problem that we have today, because they run after, after selling products more than they run after security, and of course they do, because businesses there will business too. So in the end, they want to sell their product, and it turns out that sandboxes and blinking boxes have sold a lot better in the past than disassemblers. Anyway, I went on from the disassemblers. Um, what I saw there, or what I saw in myself when I tried to develop tools in reverse engineering, I'm not exceptionally good at that, by the way, I'm a terrible software engineer, and so are most people. The, the tools that I wrote had 
massive problems with, with vulnerabilities in, in themselves, with functionality lacks, with updates. I haven't updated the last tool that I wrote within, I think, eight months. And I figured out this is, this is a vast problem for all of us. Um, and then when, when I started at Intel, I figured out that my problem wasn't actually software engineering, but my problem was reading. So with the first, the first tasks that I was tasked to do, or to, to, to solve at Intel, my mentor gave me the Intel SDM, the Software Developer's Manual. He gave me my task and he said, figure it out. And I was sitting there with a the manual and the, the chapter that could or should have told me how to solve my problem was only 50 pages long. If you look at the manual, it has almost 5,000 pages. So 50 pages isn't that much at all. So I sat down and read those 50 pages and tried to figure out the solution for my problem. And after I sat there for two days reading that manual, trying to find exactly what I needed, I figured out it's not in there. And I went back to him and said, it's not like, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't find my solution. And he said, go back, read it again, you'll find it. And in the end, I found the solution for my problem. It was, it was outlined in half a line. It was maybe almost one line of text in a paragraph on page, I don't know, 24 of the 50 pages that I was supposed to read. And this was my solution. And in the end, I figured out I could have seen this. I could have looked closer. I could have tried again. I could have tried harder. I could have been more exact and more structured in my way of work. And I would have found that solution. Um, but I didn't. Because, well, 4,810 pages are really scary. And if you start in a professional project, may it be software development or reverse engineering, whatever you want to do, and you look at this vast amount of information in front of you, it's scary, right? Most people look at that and they're like, nah. And they go back to what they did before and try to solve the problem with the things that they already know. But the solution in that case, or for me personally, would have been to step out of my, my boundaries and go back and read the text again and, and try harder and fail more and write more code to test my problem and to improve that code and eventually make it work. So yeah, I learned how to read. Also, what's interesting about problems at Intel, some problems are answered within the, the STM. So some, some answers you can find in there, and some problems are just not documented in there. So for some issues that I've been tasked to work, about, uh, to work on, um, they are just not described in the 5,000 pages of manual. And this is rather scary. But let's go on. What did I learn about security at, at conference expo halls? Um, that's, that's a tough one. So this expo hall is empty, but imagine that this expo hall is full of exhibitors, full of big companies that all um, represent their products and what, whatever people do at, at security expos. Um, coincident has it that in 2016, no sorry, 2015, I was, uh, I was present at the RSA conference in San Francisco, but not, not at the actual conference, but at the booth of my company. So the company thought that it was a good idea to have a researcher at their booth. So there were like six sales agents and our manager and me. And we're there to represent the company. What I didn't know then is that we were actually supposed to talk to people that were interested in our products. That was, that was an interesting experience. But what was more interesting is that most people came up with questions that I couldn't answer. I was... Um, I was there expecting questions about our machine learning algorithms that we use for evaluating our features. I was expecting questions about the features that we extract or about how our detection qualities are or about how our throughput is. But people came up and asked me about the bandwidth our product could cover and about how many machines they could protect with one of our boxes and about how, how the, the approach scales and about how often updates come in and about how easy updates can be can be put into the machine and how, how easy feeds can be fed into the machine and which data formats we support. And I had no idea of any of this because I just hadn't thought that this was the points that were important to customers. Um, that showed me that there is, there is the, the research community. I count myself part of that. We like to pick apart bits and bytes. And then there's people who are interested in getting their business going and keep on selling their own services with the help of our security products that we try to sell them. And um, turns out they're more interested in keeping their business going than in the security of their business, which of course they do, because this is what puts money on their tables, uh, what puts food on their tables and what, what gets them in their income. 
So I learned that me as a researcher, I was, I was partially running the wrong direction. I was, I was judging the technology that we had without considering the customers that had to use it in the end. And me renting doesn't actually help them all that much. And I went on learning throughout my, my field trip in security. I also learned that um, not only our customers, but also our larger community sees IT security as something totally different than what I had expected. Um, spring of 2017, I had the honors of participating in an OSC conference in Vienna. Um, OSC is tasked with security within Europe and um, between European states and the larger uh, nation state community out there, and they manage communications between those states. Anyhow, in 2017, OSC task themselves with uh, spending more, more of their time on cybersecurity. So in 2017, they formed the cybersecurity conference in Vienna. And I was there on the podium telling them about problems of malware and, and security problems overall. And um, I was impressed. I was very impressed by the present audience that had never seen a debugger before. They have no idea what a disassembler is. They don't know what a rootkit is and why a rootkit is, in theory, more sophisticated than a ransomware or whatever the, the different categories are. But they were interested in why, why Russia would deny that they ever hacked any, any computer in Ukraine. They were interested in the cyber powers of the United States compared to the cyber powers of France. They were interested in establishing more communication links before any cyber attack escalates on international levels. And I realized I have no idea what these people are talking about. So I know my ransomware, I know my kids. I don't know how Russia talks to the United States. So in the end, I figured out that there's different levels to security that I didn't even know exist. For one, the customers that are interested in selling their services, the policy people that are interested in communicating properly so we can all keep on living in peace. And all of them do not actually care about the bits and bytes and the threat detection in between. So yeah, I learned a lot of my field trip into policy world and the art of the nation state one-on-ones. But the reason why I was actually invited to speak there, or I was actually present at the conference, was because before that I had spent a vital part of my, my spare time on analyzing nation state malware. A couple of years ago I gave a talk about the A and the P of the T. That means the, the advancedness and the persistence of, of the threat of, of APTs. I like that little joke of mine because most of the APT malware or the so-called APT malware that I've been looking at was not all that uh, sophisticated. Let's put it like that. So the vast majority, the vast majority of mass malware is packed, um, uses encryption to protect its communication, uses anti-analysis measures, evades sandboxes, this, all the nasty tricks that if you start into malware analysis will give you lots of headache. And then you start into advanced threats and look at those advanced threats and figure out they don't use packers, they don't use encryption, they kind of obfuscate their strings sometimes, but they don't really protect themselves from being analyzed. And I was surprised. Um, on the other hand though, there are uh, advanced threats that I would uh, totally consider advanced that um, we neatly call big game. So the whole APT hunting uh, community, I'm not sure we can call it a community, um, within those few people who like to dedicate themselves uh, to advanced threats, we, we were all diving into this, this fear because we were after the, the big glorious examples like we all heard about Stuxnet in the past, and there was Regin, and there was uh, Black, what was it, Black Bear? Like all the different bears of Russia. Like there is some interesting malware out there. There is, there is really good, really good binaries out there. But what I learned in looking closer at those binaries, I'm not kidding you, most of them are mediocre software at best. Um, if you, if you open up a commercial, a commercial executable, like let's say you look into Microsoft Word or you, no, don't do that, that would probably 
this the, the end user license agreement, take take any larger application that, that you use on Windows and put it in a disassembler and then compare it to whichever advanced threats you can get your hands on in a disassembler as well. And you will see that the code structures of the commercial product or of the larger application are a lot more complex. So in the end, I figured that all the big game out there, um, at, at the beginning of it, the software, in the end, is uh, headache-inducing malware, but it's not as advanced as we would have liked it to be. What is interesting, though, in the whole um, big game hunting community is that we're all researchers. Again, we look at bits and bytes. We we like our obfuscations. We like our sandbox evasions. That's all the things that get us excited. But in the end, we don't actually have an idea of why these binaries are used for political purposes. And by no means I'm saying that they should. Um, I'm totally against using any sort of cyber threat for targeting individuals in the name of politics or whichever political motivation might be behind there. But I have to state here that n no one in the, in the big game hunting community, whichever company they work for, whichever country that company is located in that they work for, has any idea of why nation states, um, or which, which motivations drive nation states to use those cyber tools. Um, yeah, that's why I'm saying we're all APT big game hunting like Carl would. Um, yeah, and as I just mentioned, I just wish all the advanced threats were that advanced. Then it would be a little bit more interesting. So in the end, what did I just talk about? What, what did I learn from, um, from nation state malware about, about cyber war? Because this is what we're all thinking about when we hear nation states send out malware and, and infect individuals. What I actually learned about the whole scenery out there is pretty much nothing. Um, I, I, some of you might have heard that I have a special affinity to French malware. Some of you might have heard that I looked into other nation state malware as well. Yeah, I, I saw binaries, like especially in, in the case where I looked into French nation state malware. I saw their binaries. I, I saw what the binaries can do. I saw what the binaries cannot do. I have very little uh, information about where the binaries were found. Looking at the overall information landscape that I have, I have no idea why France would write malware and, and use it to spy on individuals in, in other countries. And in a sense, um, I'm a binary researcher. I cannot know. Why would I? I have no political background. So earlier this year, um, I was at a security conference in Germany uh, called Troopers, and I watched a talk by a security researcher called Mara Tam. She has a, a, a background, she has a PhD in, in history, and she has spent large amounts of, of her research time working on, on arms control. And then from arms control, slipped into cyber arms control, and now she's looking at nation state malware, because that's exactly what we're talking about, cyber arms. If you're interested in hearing someone who actually knows politics and policy speaking about nation state malware, I would totally recommend checking out her, her presentation and her GitHub repository where she tells us what it actually takes to understand those um, attacks, which would be reading about what was the documents of 20 years of mostly failed cyber norms at the United Nations. Because there you will learn a lot of why nation states are interested in cyber arms. Um, but also, yeah, one of my hobbies in the past was attribution and I really like this quote from Eva Said on Twitter when she said, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like APT28. In the end, I would attest us as a, a nation state research community that we do not really know what's going on out there. We are just, um, how is that? Someone on Twitter mentioned the community is more like sports commentators picking on particular actions that the actors are deciding to show us and the rest of what's happening. We don't really have an insight. Finally, after I, after I kind of sneaked out from the, from the nation state malware research, I went into incident response. Um, initially, I thought that in incident response, I would see how the attacks actually happen, which, which I did. Incident response is a great field if you want to learn how, how attacks are actually performed. If you get to, to analyze the whole 
the whole path of where the attackers came from, how they got into the network, what they did in the network, and how they got out again of the network, or how they got data out again of the network. That's a, that's a very instructive um, exercise. But in the end, I, I was frustrated there again, because it turns out if you work on incident response nowadays, what you mostly see is ransomware. Turns out that most of the incidents that um, we try to fix today, I'm not saying there's no APD happening, but I'm saying most of them are not the advanced persistent threats that me, me as an analyst was hoping for, but it's usually ransomware. And it's also usually large companies with large networks that got hit the hardest, uh, that get hit the hardest, and their, their larger problem is not that they have ransomware in the system, like they, they can reset their boxes, they can recover their data. The larger problem is that they have no idea how those threats got into their network. Because their networks are so huge. And that gets me back to where I started from in the beginning, businesses will business, and security researchers will security research, and we will be ranting, um, we'll be ranting a lot, we're huge cynicists, we will be criticizing, we'll be going on Twitter, we'll be getting out the popcorn, we'll be watching the world burn, and we will never understand the problems of the other side if we don't take any, side to, uh, any, any time to look at what other professionals are interested in. If you have a law company, they, they want to do law. They don't necessarily want to do firewalls. So this is the problems that we should be working on um, rather than criticizing from the bottom up that these people don't understand binary, looking at ourselves that we don't understand what these people are actually after. The updatability problem has also been mentioned in the opening note. If you have a large network, um, you'll, you'll see wonders and wonders of things that are happening on that network. Um, one of my first incident responses when I started in that field was at a hospital. You will not believe how hospital networks look like. I wish someone would at some point get down and write papers on how hospital networks would look like, because that's actually scary. Um, if you have any plan to go to a hospital soon, don't, don't listen so closely, it's all okay. But if you go in there and you look at like the patient zero and you find out the patient zero is a Windows 2000 server that uh, is not exactly connected to the, to the closed off uh, bubble of the network where it couldn't talk out, but kind of has direct internet connection. And um, if you then look at what was that, the domain controllers, and figure out that there isn't like five, but kind of like 50 domain admins on there. And if you ask someone if they know where, well, the other 45 came from, and no one actually knows, then you have, you have a long day. Usually those incidents, by the way, they all happen on Friday afternoon. I'm not kidding. At, every time, Friday afternoon. Finally, what else do I learn in incident response? The belief and, and the lack of belief is a large problem, not only in incident response, but in the whole security industry and writing products, um, in politics and nation state, in writing nation state malware and in, in, in lack of nation state malware. Whatever. So belief is something that I, I think is a, is a human trait. We all like to believe in things. We like to make our opinions. We like to believe in our moral and we like to stick to that. And we just refuse to believe in things that do not fit our picture of the world. Now, this is a very interesting experience when you talk to um, administrators that have been doing their job for the last 15 to 20 years, and have been doing their things the same every day, and it has worked for 15 years. And then someone like me comes up and tells them, uh, maybe, maybe those, those administrators that you have there on your domain controller, you should remove them, because you probably don't need them all. And these people just don't like to believe that things are changing because that's what humans do. We don't like change. So yeah, this was why, um, again, you're, you're welcome to criticize me on anything of this. I've only spent a year in incident response because then I was too frustrated to stay even one more day and left incident response back again to where I came from. Oh yeah, what I mentioned before, we don't have nation state malware that the, um, Oh, we, we don't have mass malware that, that is interesting. I wasn't actually that, that right. I also mentioned in the opening note the, the case of WannaCry, where the NSA afterwards has linked the WannaCry virus to North Korea. Um, something that I learned in attribution is that if uh, attribution is mainly done on information that's not public, 
someone comes up with an attribution conclusion that's usually not done based on the strings that define the binary. And if a, if a large institution that has lots of information that's not public comes up with a conclusion, they usually have a reason for why. So if the NSA says it's, it's North Korea, they might, might be correct. Anyway, so all of a sudden, I was working in incident response at the time. I saw lots of ransomware. All of a sudden, there was ransomware that apparently was created by a nation state actor. And that was the point when I, I, I literally I turned around and I decided I will never come back. That's when I went down low. <clears throat> So going low, what, what did that mean when I, when I said we're going low? Again, I'm, I'm there with, with the ice pick and there's the large iceberg and I'm trying to, to fight my way through. Um, there's a world beyond x86. Microarchitecture is, is vast. What, what CPUs nowadays do is uh, millions of little things. I have no aspiration whatsoever to understand any of it. And as a security researcher, when you're, when you're dumped into that whole pool, there is a whole lot of new challenges that you have to face. I had an interesting conversation before this keynote with one of my colleagues who uh, is an experienced uh, exploit author and has dedicated lots of time on, on Linux kernel exploitation. And he lined out to me of, of why he, of, of, about his motivation of why he joined our team, which was he, he initially started exploitation in userland, had lots of experience there um, back in the days when there weren't many protections. Then userland, uh, came up with more and more protection, so exploits wouldn't, wouldn't be that easy there anymore. And then he moved to kernel because there were less protections. It was still a more complex field to figure out, but the level of security down there wasn't as advanced as it was in New Zealand already. So then he went around kernel, and now he went um, into the wonderlands of, of CPU security because there's still lots of, lots of things to discover down there. What you need for taking this step, we also had a lengthy conversation about changing careers. As you've seen before, most of my, most of my professional life I've spent on, on threats and threat protection, and it took me lots of energy, lots of cuts and pain resistance, lots of sweating, lots of tears, lots of frustration, to work my way towards microarchitectural security. And finally, what it takes from them personally to get wherever uh, your research goal takes you is lots of patience, lots of practice, lots of repeats. As Halvar uh, lined it out on Twitter, CPU microarchitecture is a world of black magic, dragons, and endless trial and error. And this is exactly what I've just been talking about, endless trial and error, otherwise you'll be eaten by the dragons. Some weeks ago, I found my first bug at Intel. I was super proud. Here is the, the bug that's literally inside of Intel. Um, <laughs> what, what, what did I do to to dig my way to the, to the lower level. Uh, I don't have much experience in offensive research. What, what we do, my team at Intel is, is mainly offensive research. We try to hack our own products. And let's just mention that's super complex. So what did I do? I went back to school. Since I, since I joined the company, I've written a whole list of Hello World. I've got back to the, to the start, to the simple things. I wrote a Hello World in Intel as checks. I wrote a Hello World as a Linux kernel module. I wrote a Hello World in, in microcode as a patch, and I wrote another Hello World that I'm legally not allowed to speak here. Anyway, so a long list of, of things where I started from scratch again. Um, there was an interesting conversation by, by Harun, uh, an interesting presentation, I think it was a keynote by Harun Mir, um, a couple of years ago that was titled You and Your Research. I, I would very much recommend watching that presentation because Arun uh, neatly lines out that you can conquer one field after another, but once you're specialist in one particular field, it's very hard for you personally and, and for your public reputation to go back to writing Hello Worlds. This is what you're supposed to do. If you conquer a new field, you start with the, with the simple things and you go more advanced and you conquer this area and then you go into the next area and so on and so forth. But this is, uh, turns out, sometimes very, very hard to jump over your own shadow and uh, go back to the, to the school bench. But that's for me what is the meaning of growth. If you never go back to the school bench, if you never go back to writing Hello Worlds and trying to figure out new things, you will never actually grow. The whole, the whole process of, of growing mentally is, is a very uncomfortable process. Um, 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 I was very frustrated when I was sitting there trying to, to write my first SGX application and I failed and failed and failed and it took me a week and a half to even compile my Hello World. I'm not kidding, I was this bad. But in the end I, I managed to, I was growing and um, 
I realized how uncomfortable it was. I thought myself I was an experienced security researcher. I can reverse engineer a nation state malware, but I cannot compile a project in Visual Studio. That was very frustrating. Anyway, in the end, once you manage your new goals, you grow and grow, and you'll see the more goals that you reach, the faster you actually grow. Um, I've seen the same things uh, with, with a couple of students of mine. Some of you might have heard that some years ago, I, I started a, a workshop. I started a reverse engineering workshop. Uh, or it's actually a boot camp. It's a free reverse engineering boot camp, and it's for women only. Some years ago, I, I came up with the idea of putting a workshop together and sit down with the two women I knew who were interested in learning reverse engineering. And I thought this would be sort of a pajama party with our notebooks at home, and we would look at the binary. And I put a blog post together, and I asked if someone else wanted to join me, and all of a sudden, there were 15 registrations. I didn't know there were 15 women in security that wanted to learn reverse engineering. And that was when, when Black Hoodie was born. Black Hoodie is a, is a free reverse engineering bootcamp for, for women. We had three editions so far from 2015, 16, 17. There's a typo on the slide. No, it's not 2015. Oh. Yeah, in the first year we had 15 attendees, uh, the second year we had 32, and last year, the third edition, we had 67. You see, we, we double our size every year, which is kind of scary. We had lots of different nationalities, lots of different continents, and the girls that came to the workshop were super motivated. I was scared. Up until the workshop, I was a teacher at a university in, in Austria. I was teaching reverse engineering classes, and my classes were male only. That wasn't my decision, there was no decision uh, made ever on this. Of course, it was how it naturally was. There were no, no women in the security courses. So I was sitting there teaching male-only classes, and at some point I was supported by that. I said, I want a women-only class too. This is one of the reasons why I, I founded the workshop and made it as damn challenging as possible. Most of the, the attendees in the workshop were juniors, so they were kind of just starting to learn what a debugger is and starting to learn how disassemblers work. And I said, let's, let's sit down together um, for two days. We're going to reverse engineer a piece of malware. Most of them were, well, kind of nervous. This looks difficult. This looks challenging. And I told them, don't be, don't be scared. This is something challenging. But we can, we can get there in two days. And after those two days, you'll have mastered something complex. And having mastered something complex gives you the feeling like you can, you can do that again. You have done something difficult. Now everything that's simple is super easy. And then I saw most of the attendees that went back to conquer those easier fields, like, super swiftly. I saw most of them grow faster than I had ever seen with any of my university students in my male-only classes. And now, why? why? Why am I doing a workshop? Why am I, uh, am I thinking this makes sense? Why am I watching those girls just blow my mind every year and again and again? Um, uh, let's start how, how I got into the industry. In the beginning, when I, when I started going to school, I went to a software engineering school when I was 14. I looked like the, that bird on the left side. I was one out of three girls within 36 students, and we were walking into that class and we were like, hmm, I'm not sure I belong here. I'm not sure I'm, I'm comfortable here. This looks, this looks weird. And this was like the, the story throughout all my life. So after, after this engineering school, I went to university, I studied a security program in Austria. There were three women within 20, 29 students. After that, I went to um, the antivirus companies in the lab. I was the only woman within seven engineers. And then I went to the advanced threat protection company. I was the only woman in research within, I think, five researchers. And it, it goes on like that. At Intel and my team, I'm again the only woman. I kind of, I stopped. I stopped feeling like an alien over the years, but it's still, it, it's still bugging me. So I came up with this idea of the woman only workshop because I thought if I just, if I just create some space where those girls can sit and can figure out this is not scary. It's not biting you. It's not rocket science. It's, it's actual fun poking around binaries and looking at, at x86 assembly. Um, maybe they'll stick around. Maybe I'm not going to be that lonely anymore in the future. It's not, it's not actually that much fun feeling like an alien whenever you enter a room and everyone just looks different. So yeah, that was the, the idea and it worked out incredibly well. If you look here in the first row, there's, there's four, four girls sitting. Four. I think there is a fifth one somewhere around here hiding in the back. So five of, of the former attendees of, of my workshop are here today. And if you look through at the greater room, you won't see all that many women around here. This is actually impressive. 
Hi, guys. Um, so yeah, the, the, the idea how I like to call it is uh, we, don't, we don't want to separate that workshop from the security community. We don't want something that's our own. We don't want to start a larger sisterhood that takes over the industry. We want to create some space. We want to create some space that's inviting um, female engineers to come to the workshop and to grow their, their skills and to feel comfortable and master something complicated. And after the workshop, the girls went out and they went crazy. So for the last three years, we've been doing that workshop and I've been, I've been following some of those, those engineers in their, in their career development. And you won't see, you, you won't believe they literally blew my mind. We now have one of them who's, I think she's here as well. She's giving a workshop on arm shell codes here at HITB. And again, the, the, that workshop we were sitting there, we were looking at a piece of malware for two days. There was no ARM involved at all, no shell coding. But three years later, she's now giving workshops on, on ARM shell code. There's another candidate I liked very much. I mean, I think I have a slide on that. No, it's like I'm there. Another candidate I liked very much is now working on Windows kernel internals. She's injecting code from, from kernel end to user land and working on kernel shins. And there's a couple of others that just picked totally different research fields and had insane success there. And now after, after the three editions, um, we go out and create spin-off events of the larger Black Hoodie project, which I call minority-driven boot camps. You wouldn't believe how much drive you will find if you have a room of women in front of you and you tell them you give them a sledgehammer and you want them to take the binary apart, like with aggression. They will be like, yes, yes, let's do this. This is the kind of scary part, and this is exactly that the drive that I, that I see in the workshops that I think makes them go out and conquer the industry. Um, what I mean with we're, we're creating spin-offs, we had three main editions. This year there will be another main edition that's been host, uh, gonna be hosted in Berlin. But we also started to have little Black Hoodie events on the side. Um, they're not as, not as strict as the main conference. There was one of those spin-offs happening this year's Troopers Conference that was open for male attendees as well. Because the, the main idea with those spin-offs, as I see it, is, is not, as with the main event, creating space where everyone can feel comfortable, but to put the attendees in the roles of the trainers. So all of those spin-off events will be taught not by me, but by the former attendees at the workshop. So they go out and spread their knowledge themselves and feed their, their own efforts back to the larger community. Because this is what I, where I see the future of those workshops, not as a, as a closed off cubicle where we hide and do our own things, but as an effort to strengthen the community from within, to come up with more trainers and more speakers, with more researchers, with more low level specialists that can then go out, improve tools and can improve uh, detection mechanisms and can improve offensive research, can write more exploits, can find vulnerabilities in, I'm not gonna say this now, like in, in, in products. And uh, yeah, makes the world after all a better place. As I mentioned, there are some candidates that have shown incredible growth after they left the workshop. There was one of them who recently hacked the Windows Minesweeper to finally show her where all the goddamn mines are. I was super impressed. I had no idea this, this was a thing she was interested in. And that was only like three months after the workshop. I don't necessarily know what she did before, but I don't think she hacked Minesweeper before. Another candidate I was super impressed with uh, last year at the, at the workshop gave a talk about uh, dumping flash from, from hardware devices, which is also something I did not teach her. That was super impressive. Another candidate, as mentioned before, is now a world-recognized ARM researcher giving a workshop here on, on ARM shell coding. And then there's another one that I was super proud of that um, has d dived into Windows kernel, and if you see, this is one of her opening slides from one of her talks, where she talks about the kernel shim engine, and I'm not kidding, I have no idea what the kernel shim engine actually does. But I, I recommend you check out her talk, and check out all of their talks, and they're now actively contributing to our community, and I'm sitting back like a proud mama and still only doing my, uh, my Melbourne research. So this is super amazing. Also, the other girls have produced more, more and more research, so expect more of us to come in the future. Finally, after all that journey through my, my disappointments and all the things that I've learned and all the things that I've seen and the workshop and how I think we can get better, let me tell you what, what my recent job change told me about life. 
As mentioned seven months ago, I started work at Intel and I moved to Portland, Oregon. And Portland, Oregon, you won't believe it, is like the most crazy city I've ever seen. Um, on this picture here, you see the Unipiper. The Unipiper is kind of like a Portland legend. Um, you might see that he's wearing a Darth Vader costume. He is sitting on a unicycle. He's playing a bagpipe that blows fire. This is kind of like the Tuesday afternoon in Portland. Um, right when I moved there, I was, I was strolling through downtown and was passed by by a guy in a white latex onesie who was like on his way, I don't know, to the coffee shop. A couple of weeks later, I watched a guy in a, in a Captain America pajama right outside of my house on a bike tackling the hill and where he would go down. He was sitting on a bike and then he let the brakes loose and just went down the hill in his Captain America outfit. I think he was trying to fly. Um, on another occasion, I was standing at the pharmacy, lining up at the cash desk, and saw a guy in a crocodile costume who was standing there in line with me, and I was staring at him, super curious, and no one else did. So, apparently I was the only one shocked by a guy in a crocodile costume in the pharmacy. Then another occasion, I saw a guy, no, there was actually, there was a girl in a dragon costume on the, um, on the tram. She was just getting in, sitting down, and again, I was staring at her, and no one else did anything. Um, Portland has, uh, um, a mermaid parade, where you have to dress up as a mermaid to actually take part. They have a bacon festival. They have, uh, they have lots of different glow parties with lots of neon colors. I am, I'm pretty much out of all the crazies, but you, you get the idea. Portland has totally blown my mind in what people are actually capable of doing if they are just themselves. So if they feel comfortable in the position that they're in, they do incredible things. And this is something that I think our community could learn from those crazy people in Portland. If we just let everyone be exactly that great person that they are and let them go ahead and do their amazing things, then we're going to see people in crocodile costumes. So, since you all work in security, um, I hope you learned something from my talk. I hope you go back to your teams and your companies and improve the situation there and um, know why not build better products and, and care less about selling and more about security. So, this was it. I'm over time already. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, hit me up afterwards. I'm going to be around at the conference all the time. So, thank you very much and enjoy the conference.